Thank you. So I'm giving this talk for Dr. Senegor, who couldn't be here because of flight issues. And I'm going to talk about abdominal perineal resection. Uh, and the, the issue he was asked to address was whether it's a failing operation. So the reason we're concerned about abdominal perineal resection is that classically, it's been associated with the highest rates of local failure. And if you're a patient, whether it's a radiological local recurrence or a clinical local recurrence that was sent in for a redo APR, this is obviously a disastrous situation because of pain and local symptoms. Now, local recurrence is common. Uh, this is a paper by Anna Martling from the Karolinska Group. Uh, and it's a nice paper because it summarizes uh, the results in Stockholm, where they've had a long-term interest in rectal cancer. Uh, and they compared in this paper the results of the Stockholm 1, Stockholm 2 studies, and then data from the TME era. And you can see that the end colostomy rate, or APR, was 60% and 55%. And it was only with the change in surgery, not the inclusion of radiation, that the APR rate dropped. And this is still fairly high. What you can also see is the local recurrence rate in the order of 20%. And in fact, if you look at the literature for abdominal perineal resection, there are local recurrence rates up to 50%. Even in the MRC Classic trial, which compared laparoscopic and open surgery for rectal cancer in the United Kingdom, well, they had a two to one randomization, and this is just the rectal cancer patients. So 250 laparoscopic to 128 open. And you can see the positive circumferential resection margin rate, whether it was done laparoscopically or open, was 20%. And that led to an improved local recurrence rate over what had been reported in the Stockholm and other studies, but still in the order of 10%. Now we know that the positivity of a resection margin matters. Or zero, so complete clearance of tumor has a much lower recurrence rate than positive disease. And this makes sense. And the problem classically with abdominal perineal resection is that the planes perineum have been harder for surgeons to follow. So much so that over the last five or eight years, uh, Torbjorn Holm and now some of the groups in the UK have tried to standardize the way an abdominal perineal resection is performed. Now, I think many of us have performed it in a standard fashion for decades. But I think it is a good point that they raise, because the local recurrence are high when done, people, done by people who may not be fully familiar with the technique. And so what they've tried to popularize is this concept of an extra levator abdominal perineal resection, which I'll show you in a moment, versus a standard abdominal perineal resection. And Nick West. Uh, published a multi-center report from the United Kingdom showing that by staying outside the levators, the positive margin rate dropped from 49% to 20%, and the perforation of the tumors dropped from 28 to 8%. Furthermore, they've advocated that this operation be done in a prone position, so the patients are turned into a prone jackknife position for the perineal approach. And they feel that in this non-randomized trial, that the perforation rate drops further from 20% to 6% in the prone position, although it did increase their wound complication rate. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously, the planes coming from above should be the same. We've seen them nicely demonstrated today. I'll show you them briefly in a moment. But the issue is what happens at the perineum. And this is why the local recurrence rates were the same in the laparoscopic or the open group of the classic trial, because the bottom end of the operation is done from below. And if one stays too close, and in fact, this plane is extra levator or extra sphincteric down here, but here, if you cross the levators very close to a tumor that may be in the distal rectum or upper anal sphincter, obviously, you can come very close to that tumor. And what's important is to stay outside the levators, even up to the insertion of the levators into the pelvic sidewall. And so this prevents coming close to the site of the tumor. 
and it gives one a more uniform specimen which you're removing. Again, I think many of us have been doing that for a long time, but the anatomical points bear repetition, and standardization of the technique has been uh, discussed by us and many other authors. Getting into the anatomical plane is the same, uh, and this is obviously a laparoscopic view, but the same as a laparoscopic rectal resection. One can see opening the left side of the presacral space, and I tend to just use a scissors with cautery. And now coming around on the right side, and the key to any dissection being traction and counter-traction. So drawing the mesorectum away from the presacral fascia, displaying the loose areolar tissue, and allowing one dissect in the appropriate anatomical space. In the interest of time, I won't let that video run, and we'll skip along a little bit. Now, this is an important point, because posteriorly, you don't really want to come any further than the tip of the coccyx. And that's why I don't close the rectum off with a suture until after I've completed my dissection, because it's useful to be able to do a rectal exam during your dissection. And then when I complete my laparoscopic dissection, it's the only time I ever put a sponge into the abdomen. And I will put the sponge down at the base of the dissection. Then, if you're doing laparoscopic surgery, you can divide the colon and make your colostomy. And the important part then becomes the perineal approach. Now, I rarely use a prone position, but I think if you do use a lithotomy position, it's very important to put the patient into a high lithotomy position, such as used to be used by urology surgeons for a perineal approach to the prostate. I think this gives you a very nice view. You place the patient in steep Trendelenburg position so the tissues are not too vascular. You can start, and here we're, this is an anterior tumor into vagina, so we're doing a posterior vaginectomy as well. And one gets a very nice view of the anatomical plane. So you can see that we're deliberately taking a small amount of fatty tissue outside the sphincters and outside the levators. And here, we've palpated the tip of the coccyx. I don't take the coccyx unless there's evidence of local invasion. And here you can see we've divided the levator, and this is the levator coming up on the patient's right and patient's left. And we're into the space that we dissected laparoscopically. And then finally, one just comes around the front to complete the operation. Very briefly, showing you a video. Actually, I want to go back because this is an important point, because you can see here uh, the anterior plane, but out laterally you can see where the levators are inserted into the pelvic sidewall. So we're taking the levators nice and wide. Now briefly, laparoscopically, we've done our dissection to below. Uh, this was a view where I moved the sponge just to show the dissection, but you can see we're dissecting in here from below with cautery. And you don't need to do it under laparoscopic control. But you'll see at the tip of the coccyx here, the bovi coming in. And we're able to palpate the tip of the coccyx and take the levators out wide. And then here you can see that you can get a nice view. And you can hook your finger above the levators and take it out close and wide to the pelvic sidewall. And if you're doing it laparoscopically, obviously, the patient just needs a few ports and a perineal closure. And what this gives you is a nice, smooth specimen. Here you can see the mesorectal fascia, but you can see that it's complete. And this is the sphincters and the levators, and with no incision in towards where the tumor is. So we have a nice, good oncological clearance of this specimen. And this is a specimen from a patient who actually had an exenteration, so we can see bladder in front. But the same point, that there's no waste or no narrow area on the specimen. Same with the vaginectomy. So there is a slight area where it comes in, but this is where the coccyx is. But the anal canal is not narrowed, and we have not divided in on the levators. For selected patients, and this is a patient who was sent in with a local recurrence, a posterior vaginectomy, and they had a very wide perineal recurrence. 
So you can do a nice flap, and we tend to use a vertical rectus abdominis flap to recreate those. The only time I do a prone position is for patients who have a tumor extending posteriorly from the anus, uh, because I think then it gives you a much better view. Otherwise, this area is very close to the bed, and you can't get under the patient's back. So for tumors with posterior extension, that is when I will do uh, a prone position. So these are some of our data. This is a 1,000 laparoscopic colectomies done over 99 to 2005 by Tony Senegor and I when we were at the clinic, and now 1,000 cases by Brad Champagne and I uh, at Case Western. And you can see that the number of proctectomies we've done has increased. It used to be less than 10% of our practice, and now about 18%, and, and some of those would be abdominal perineal resections. And I'm going to talk about the post-operative follow-up uh, in my talk tomorrow and the post-operative care plans and how we manage the patients after surgery. Uh, these are my data since getting to Case Western, uh, looking at the laparoscopic and open cases for disease-free and overall survival. And the local recurrence rate for all rectal cancers is 2.5%. And there have been no recurrences yet for abdominal perineal resection. Now, what about this prone versus lithotomy discussion? There's actually a paper um, that uh, Dr. Fazio and Ravi Kiran published uh, from the Cleveland Clinic uh, based um, in a large portion on the time period uh, that I was there and that some others were still there. Uh, and it's from 1997 to 2007. And so obviously there were uh, a large number of surgeons there over the time period. But we had a fairly standardized technique, also standardized in that coccygectomy was not uh, a routine part of the operation. You can see whether the patients were performed in lithotomy position, which was pre preferred by most surgeons, or prone position, which was just preferred by a small number of surgeons. The lymph node harvest rates were similar, as you would expect. That depends on the pathologist. The circumferential resection margin positive rates were similar. And the positive circumferential margin rates were similar, especially when you factor in uh, the use of radiation. The local recurrence rates were identical at similar uh, four to five year follow up. This was also independent of surgeon volume. And so you can see there's an identical local recurrence rate, whether done in prone or lithotomy position, and an identical local recurrence rate. So I'd suggest to you that abdominal perineal is not a failing operation, but some of the surgeons who do abdominal perineal resection are failing. Now, I haven't discussed patient selection for abdominal perineal resection. And obviously, with intersphincteric resection and with more standardization of low anterior resection. And even, as Liliana has spoken about, with very selected cases who do not need a rectal resection, obviously fewer patients need an abdominal perineal resection. But there's no doubt that if you have to do it, it can be done in a very standardized way with very good outcomes for the patient. And I do not think that the operative position is important. The key is that you're staying wide and outside the levators, as many surgeons don't do. So the operation should be the same however you do it and wherever you do it. I think a high lithotomy position is useful. And thank you very much. Thank you.